Hello, today I'm here with uh, Yao Fu Zhao from the GW School of International Affairs. He's going to give a quick introduction himself, and then we'll get into the interview questions. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Yao Fu. I am a graduating master's student at the Space Policy Institute of George Washington University. Uh, on the side, I'm also uh, working with the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department, uh, researching on air traffic management. Before George Washington University, I got a PhD in physics from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I was mainly researching on uh, Higgs boson physics at the Large Hadron Collider, uh, mainly writing computer simulations. And uh, outside the universities, I'm also a uh, private pilot with almost um, 400 hours. Uh, so basically, I love everything that flies, and uh, and here we are. All right. So the first question today is, in outer space, there's currently a wide variety of resources, such as rare earth minerals and other objects launched by humans, such as satellites. How do we go about equitably distributing said resources in space, and who should get access to them? All right. Uh, it's a long question. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, space, uh, for the time being, is a continuation of uh, whatever is going on uh, on the Earth. So uh, inequality, inequality, competition, cooperation, and uh, conflict in space uh, are uh, all the results from what's going on uh, on the on Earth. Uh, and second, uh, we should understand that minerals and uh, satellite uh, services um, are different kinds of resources. Uh, even among uh, mineral resources, uh, uh, they are um, they are grouped in different ways uh, as they do uh, on the ground. So uh, they are um, there are different definitions of uh, of what's being uh, fairly distributed and uh, and, and so on. Um, so let's be more specific. Mm. Uh, so speaking of the difference, uh, so for ground resources, uh, there are underground uh, uh, resources to be mined. Uh, there are marine resources, uh, fresh water in, in flowing rivers and uh, uh, clean air, uh, global, global climate. Uh, obviously, they are all uh, resources uh, for, uh, for the human race, but uh, they are definitely treated differently and uh, there are different uh, mechanisms to allocate them uh, responsibly. Uh, space on the other hand uh, is, is different. Uh, one mm, part of that is space itself is a very risky business and uh, so the government cannot uh, incentivize, um, incentivize the development of the space industry by requiring the uh, space companies, uh, the commercial firms to um, to just arbitrarily mm, distribute uh, whatever uh, resources uh, they they provide, and uh, so uh, so for mineral re resources, uh, the technology uh, advance. Um, excuse me. Uh, so the technology uh, technologically techno technologically advanced countries were likely to gain access uh, to. Uh, to any form of resources uh, first. Uh, however, uh, because they are done by commercial entities, and uh, so the relocation, uh, the allocation processes of the resources uh, are up to the supply, supply and the demand relations in the global market, just like uh, uh, other uh, mineral resources uh, in circulation. Uh, of course, in this process, uh, in the circulating process, uh, geopolitics and the uh, national security considerations uh, will always uh, have their impact. Uh, so those were uh, the discussion about uh, mineral resources. And for satellite services, um, they are there are public goods uh, such as uh, weather information and uh, uh, information needed uh, for things like uh, disaster relief. Uh, and those informations uh, are public goods and they are free uh, most of the time. Uh, but there are also uh, commercial uh, services uh, such as commu communication uh, capacity and uh, satellite imaging capacity. Um, they can be used for uh, communication, uh, natural resources management, urban planning, and so on. Uh, these resources uh, can also be uh, allocated through uh, supply and uh, and the demand in the uh, in the global market. Uh, the U.S. used to uh, regulate the uh, selling of and distribution of these resources uh, more strictly, but uh, uh, I think. Uh, Right now, the gist uh, in the current U.S. Uh, U.S. practice is that if the service is already available internationally, uh, then the U.S. government would not try to stop uh, the U.S. commercial firms to uh, sell and provide those services uh, uh, internationally. 
and uh, and also uh, there are uh, partnerships uh, going on between the U.S. and uh, and say uh, Africa and uh, uh, and other uh, developing uh, countries. Uh, part of the emphasis is uh, to enable the uh, developing countries to better utilize uh, the space resources uh, that we just um, mentioned. Um, in the future, we could imagine uh, when these uh, services like uh, satellite image and uh, communication capacities become uh, more and more available, uh, the U.S. could uh, hypothetically uh, include uh, some of these uh, items in the, for example, uh, U.S. aid packages for uh, for uh, other countries. Uh, and even for uh, even when dealing with uh, European countries, uh, the U.S. Uh, will love to uh, to see and help uh, them becoming more uh, capable in many areas. Uh, and uh, uh, however, this does not have to become a um, well. A country does not have to becoming uh, to become a space uh, faring one in order to uh, best enjoy uh, the benefits from the outer space. And uh, speaking of this access to space from not just the major players alone, how do you think we can ensure that space remains accessible and clean to all and not just these wealthiest nations? And whose responsibility should it be to clean up space? How can we ensure that this is done? Uh, all right. Uh, mm, my quick answer to this would be uh, to fly responsibly, innovatively, and uh, frequently. So. Um, so the, the countries uh, that are advanced in space technologies and also the commercial uh, firms who uh, benefit uh, the most from, mm, from space uh, will have the most to lose uh, there. So they are uh, very motivated uh, to maintain a uh, clean uh, space and a safe uh, space environment. Uh, I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, Starlink of SpaceX, it performs uh, maybe 1,000 some collision avoidance maneuvers uh, each month and uh, if uh, if some bad actor makes a anti-satellite test, uh, it would add thousands of additional maneuvers for SpaceX uh, just to try to uh, uh, remain safe uh, for its constellation. So uh, so the so SpaceX uh, and other companies uh, uh, like them are definitely incentivized to maintain a sustain sustainable space uh, environment. Uh, in addition, uh, with uh, with more uh, human space uh, flights uh, in the planning, uh, we definitely uh, want to keep the space environment uh, safe for human space flight. Uh, and uh, so further, further making um, space environment dangerous uh, will just become less tolerable. And uh, traditionally, or historically, uh, it was uh, mainly the uh, the U.S. and the, the Soviet Union uh, that enjoyed uh, their space capabilities, uh, and at that time the space was not uh, as crowded uh, as to today. So, uh, so the new players, the new commercial uh, firms, and uh, and other countries trying to enter uh, space, uh, they are they could be more um, incentivized to uh, keep the space uh, environment uh, clean as well. And uh, and so the the challenge right now is to get uh, all uh, major space powers uh, on board in dealing uh, with uh, space uh, safety, sustainability, and uh, um, and, and so on. And do you know if any sort of legislature or uh, groups that have been forming or possible agreements in this uh, sector that have been forming? All right. So uh, the current uh, practice. Uh, uh, going on, they are not necessarily enforced, but the uh, the, the later uh, rules, uh, if you may, uh, are the new satellites are required to deorbit uh, within five years after becoming uh, defunct, and uh, um, and there may be ways to incentivize uh, this kind of behavior since it's not uh, strictly enforced. Uh, so, for example, when uh, when space agency um, issues uh, licensing uh, to to new uh, space activities they can uh, tr try to consider or evaluate the past uh, performance and um, of the of a commercial firm uh, uh, on how how much they were responsible in uh, managing their uh, satellites and uh, um, and another example is uh, many many satellites uh, they have um, transponders uh, to to tell the ground stations uh, where they are and some even have uh, corner reflectors 
uh, to allow them to be optically uh, tracked passively. Um, so these are the existing uh, practice. And speaking of these kind of practices or um, future goals, can you speak to me a little bit about space situational awareness or SSA? Uh, all right, space situational awareness. Uh, some people might prefer to call it uh, space domain domain awareness, uh, SDA. Um, so the the U.S. Uh, United States is uh, has the leading capacity uh, in this re regard, and uh, other countries are uh, contributing as, as well. Uh, so, for example, there's a study group called the National Space Leg Legislation Initiative. It consists of uh, many countries: as Australia, Indonesia, India, Japan, Malaysia. Philippines, uh, Republic of, of Korea, Thailand, and uh, uh, Vietnam, they are trying to, uh, to create a framework uh, that aims to promote uh, sustainability uh, in space. And also uh, South Africa is another good example uh, where space uh, situational awareness uh, facilities are hosted there. Uh, so uh, with, with, other, with new um, players trying to enter this uh, arena, um, and they have their uh, their reasons to uh, to keep the uh, space environment uh, as clean as possible, and uh, and uh, because of the future uh, space act uh, assets at, at the stake, uh, even though they might be space ferry nations uh, yet, uh, they definitely want to uh, consider uh, consider their future, and uh, uh, the long term goal or. Um, what I would say a dream is to uh, create an international regime of uh, so-called space traffic management, uh, STM. Uh, this would be, um, if I were to make an, an analogy, this would be like the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization that manages uh, civil aviation traffic uh, worldwide. Uh, of course, uh, space traffic and, uh, and air traffic are different things, but uh, uh, that would be the, uh, the long-term goal. And uh, uh, to get to there, uh, from the at least from the American perspective, uh, the U.S. needs to have consensus within uh, its uh, space industry. All right. And then uh, what do you think is responsibility of these wealthy nations are in space towards poor nations who want to engage in space travel? And how can we ensure that such demands are met? Uh, all right. There are. Um, there are different levels uh, to this uh, to this answer. I think uh, one of the limiting factor uh, is, uh, I think, uh, from my reading of this question, uh, I think uh, you definitely want uh, want uh, developing uh, countries uh, eventually to be able to uh, to send uh, their human astronauts uh, to the space. Uh, and right now, the capacity for human spaceflight uh, would be a, a limiting factor. So uh, just like um, luxury travel in in business jets, uh, that's not accessible to everyone everywhere. Uh, space travel as a luxury way, uh, luxury way of life is not going to happen uh, everywhere at once, and uh, it's also um, it's also not the most uh, cost uh, effective uh, for uh, the especially the developing countries to uh, auto send their. Uh, astronauts uh, to the space, it's far more cost effective to allow them um, to enable their uh, workforce to effectively utilize the uh, space services that we mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, however, we should rec we, we do should recognize that uh, uh, if a developing country can uh, actually have uh, their uh, first uh, astronauts uh, to, the, to the space, uh, it will be very encouraging and uh, it will carry uh, uh, symbolic uh, significance, and uh, and that might inspire uh, their entire country and even their uh, neighboring countries. So uh, this is definitely something uh, we can can consider. Uh, and uh, if uh, the U.S. and the, the developed world has the capacity, um, it can definitely uh, for the uh, U.S. space industry and the foreign relation communities to consider uh, these options when when they work with uh, the rest of the world. And uh, uh, hypothetically, you could imagine uh, if uh, if someone mm, becomes su successful in colonizing Mars uh, by sending a million people to, to the Mars, again, hypothetically, um, then there's probably seats for everyone there. But even in that case, uh, it will re require education, training, 
and the personal dedication uh, to this effort. So, um, so definitely uh, there are lots of things uh, to be done on the ground before we can send uh, many more people to the, to the other space. Cool. And uh, speaking on the future of space exploration and regulation, how do you think that we might go about ensuring space is a standardly regulated place without arbitrary rules so that it can function as smoothly as possible and prevent potential conflicts? Well, I really uh, like this. Uh, I really love this question. So, like uh, all other international laws, uh, they uh, they never stop stops evolving. Uh, if one does not want uh, arbitrary rules, uh, which which is actually a typical case for international laws, uh, so uh, again, fly responsibly, innovatively, and uh, frequently. So uh, we should just keep making things happen, including mistakes. Uh, this will uh, allow us to create a good uh, precedents in the aftermath of uh, all of the events. Uh, the, the United States has a, uh, a very deep common law tradition, uh, which evolves with precedents. Uh, this is uh, one significant strength of, the, uh, of America. So, um, so America can afford a relatively high uh, launch uh, capacity and cadence uh, by the many players in the US space industry, uh, plus the American uh, common law tradition um, so this combination um, might be making the best ecosystem in the world to originate good space law. Uh, I would also envision that uh, uh, that's uh, an internationally agreeable uh, rules uh, would embody uh, the accepted culture and the common sense of the existing aerospace industry and the government around the globe. Uh, I'll give you some more uh, concrete uh, examples in this. So you will, uh, so for the rules to be um, to be internationally agreeable, it needs to be uh, straightforward to understand. Uh, it should carry little ambiguity and it should be easily uh, verifiable. Um, so in the uh, in the aerospace uh, existing aerospace industry um, and in civil aviation, uh, there are so-called the uh, right of way rules. Um, um, so maybe two of the examples is uh, the more maneuverable traffic uh, will uh, tend to give way to the less maneuverable ones. And also uh, if, a, uh, if some vehicle is under uh, emergency or distress, uh, other traffic should, uh, should make way uh, uh, for their convenience. Uh, so, so these are just two examples of uh, rules that are uh, common sense and, uh, and are easily uh, agreeable by almost uh, everyone uh, anywhere. And uh, so you want to carry a similar spirit to uh, when, when you make the, the rules for the space. Um, uh, I can give another hypothetical uh, example for, uh, for, for rules in space. Maybe you will always want, uh, want uh, the, the crewed spacecraft uh, to, um, to have some priority uh, over the uncrewed spacecraft uh, just to consider the safety for human beings. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you do not want to deliberately take advantage of these rules uh, by uh, subjecting uh, astronauts to a risky, uh, more risky than necessary condition. Uh, so uh, these are some examples. Uh, I can give you one negative uh, example uh, in making the rules for, uh, for space. Um, so, uh, so it's very common practice, uh, in especially in research and the development, uh, to use machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence uh, methods. So, uh, and uh, and this uh, the solution. For, for example, for example, you could have a uh, space traffic management scenario, and uh, and some researcher uh, can come up with a solution for this scenario. Um, with a machine learning uh, method. And uh, the solution uh, can be globally uh, optical in a theoretical sense, but, but if uh, the solution um, cannot be easily uh, or intuitively understood by uh, human experts in the industry, uh, it's hard to imagine such um, solution to become the cornerstone uh, stone of, uh, of a internationally agreeable space traffic management uh, regime. So this would be one an active example. Uh, so this solution, uh, it could still be effective 
within a commercial forum. For example, um, the, uh, the Starlink constellation of SpaceX. Uh, so within uh, this constellation, the uh, SpaceX can use uh, whatever methods that's uh, most uh, effective and efficient to manage uh, their constellation among themselves. But, uh, um, but uh, again, when you are dealing with international players, uh, the rules needs to be um, much simplified. And uh, uh, another uh, item is um, if, if you envision some evolutionary uh, set of rules uh, that are enabled by future technology, uh, you also need to come up with a way to have the current set of rules to evolve to the, the future one. Because uh, as I mentioned, international laws are more evolutionary than uh, revolutionary. So the larger the scope, uh, the, the slower the evolution is. And uh, uh, typically, you do not want to see uh, sudden mutations uh, in the ecosystem. And uh, speaking of the conflict you asked about, um, it depends on the nature of the of the conflict. I think uh, if you have a good uh, system, good set of rules, um, many conflicts can already be uh, managed and, and absorbed by this uh, existing ecosystem. So, um, and and also the um, and and also these conflicts might uh, might allow uh, resolutions to come about, and uh, and then people can uh, can use uh, these resolutions as um, as precedents to you know to to allow the rules to uh, continuously uh, evolve. So that that not, might not be a, a bad thing. And with the the strength of the U.S., uh, the United States, uh, its allies and the partners, um, they can probably win uh, and or resolve any conflict uh, uh, with uh, with their uh, competitors. But but if you uh, have demoralized and desperate. Uh, actors uh, in this ecosystem, uh, they could disrupt uh, the ecosystem such that uh, there will be no uh, winner afterwards. So that's my take on uh, on the conflict. And right. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, just for everyone to clarify, such modifications in the ecosystem that I'm going to talk about is um, like intentionally causing pollution or a large amount of debris in the low Earth orbit, which would contribute to a phenomenon that has been uh, called Kessler syndrome. And this would essentially just be where uh, one uh, collision of debris would cause fragmentation of the debris, which would in turn cause future collisions and lead to this chain reaction of green explosion, which as Yahoo said, could lead it to being a situation where everyone loses and it's uninhabitable by all, which is obviously something that we want to prevent. And uh, there's just a clarification there. And just to move on to the next question now, what do you think that we should and shouldn't be allowed to do in space and why? For example, should we be able to build in space, extract resources, or should we be unable to modify the environment? Uh, again, uh, like, like the way we discuss uh, international space rules, uh, we do not want the uh, rules to be arbitrary. And uh, uh, if there are arbitrary components in the, in the rules, they are probably not going to uh, get accepted by everyone in the world. So. Um, so I think it's more important to uh, to uh, to consider the, the 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 process of the uh, the, the making of the, the rule. And so, um, uh, give you two two examples. Let's say uh, uh, in in the in an extreme example, uh, you could uh, we we could uh, we could use a, a nuclear weapon to uh, uh, to. To defend uh, the the Earth against some uh, asteroid, uh, this is highly uh, hypothetical, but uh, it's um, it's a you know it's a scenario we could uh, uh, consider as a as a thought experiment. And uh, uh, on the opposite end, uh, because of the dual use nature of space technologies, uh, even the most benign um, space technology can be used to do to do damage. So uh, that, that's uh, and, uh, and that's the reason why there's even not a agreeable list of space debris uh, out there for uh, active uh, removal because, uh, because the, of the, the sake. And, uh, and so uh, what's important, uh, I think, is, um, is first, uh, whatever we do, we should, uh, we should have a good intention. Of course, uh, intention uh, is quite subject and hard to, uh, to verify. And that's why uh, it's crucial to build a 
a, uh, a strong space uh, domain awareness uh, regime. And, and also, uh, and also uh, from the discussion uh, before, uh, we should uh, allow the, or have the actors uh, be able to take responsibility or afford the liability uh, when things go, go wrong. Uh, and, uh, and the third, uh, if you have to say you can astronaut or make some significant impact, uh, the decision process needs to be uh, transparent and uh, and hopefully uh, have have some consensus uh, among uh, everyone that uh, involves. So so those will be my my take. All right, uh, thank you. And then I guess lastly, what do we have a right to build and store in space, and what should be prohibited, and how or should this or can be incorporated to this set of rules that are all agreed upon? Uh, uh, right now, there are there are not uh, too many rules, but uh, but on the other hand, uh, the rules we have are uh, are sort of uh, sufficient from our previous uh, discussion. So the the existing rules we have are from the the Outer Space Treaty and the, the Moon Treaty. Uh, by the way, the Moon Treaty is not uh, ratified by the the U.S. and the most countries in the world. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, we do not allow. Uh, nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction uh, deployed in the outer space. We also do not allow uh, military bases uh, built upon uh, the lunar surface or Mars or uh, asteroid. Mm. And uh, uh, and uh, speaking of uh, what's, um, what should be prohibited, uh, I think uh, nobody would uh, welcome space uh, junk uh, anymore, and uh, and uh, uh, we we have uh, mentioned uh, about space station awareness and uh, space traffic management uh, in this interview already. But uh, uh, but 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 again, uh, this um, dealing with uh, space junk uh, would be a uh, a significant uh, topic uh, going on because uh, because uh, future uh, constellations uh, and the existing ones will have to. Make um, tens of tens of thousands of uh, avoidance maneuvers uh, each each year, uh, just dealing with that. So nobody welcomes that. Uh, and also, uh, uh, we do not want um, spacefaring nations to uh, design uh, satellite orbits that uh, that endangers uh, other space assets out there already. Uh, one example is the so-called ratio grid uh, space. Uh, Retrograde geostationary geostationary orbit. So those will be uh, station geostationary orbit, but uh, in the opposite direction. And you can imagine uh, that will just uh, increase the uh, chance of uh, collision with many uh, satellites uh, out there. And uh, so, so if someone uh, launch a uh, retrograde uh, space space stationary uh, orbit satellite, uh, it can face significant backslash uh, in the world, around the world. Uh, also, um, mm, yeah, those those are the, the probably more concrete examples. But uh, but again, if you if you uh, want to or have to nuke an asteroid for whatever reason, uh, you will have to uh, be extra uh, careful in the decision making process. Uh, the decision making process needs to be uh, transparent. And also, you want as much consensus as possible uh, for everyone that's affected. So those three be my answer. All right. Well, thanks so much. That just uh, about wraps up all the internet uh, interview questions. So thanks so much. I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you.